Hello, everyone. Welcome. And thank you so much for joining us for this very special occasion as we proudly present two individuals who really don't need any, any introduction at all because most of us are only too aware of their accomplishments. They are, of course, pioneering serial entrepreneur and four-time author, I believe, Tom Siebel, and Forbes publisher, and uh, also author of multiple best-selling books, Rich Karlgaard, who also happens to be the co-founder of the Churchill Club. Uh, in their conversation called Opportunities, Risks, and the Digital Transformation Gold Rush, Tom and Rich will address four significant trends that are unfolding. Elastic cloud computing, big data, AI, and IoT, and then talk about uh, the implications that Tom sees or that Rich sees for opportunities they had for specifically innovation and economic growth. Uh, the catalyst for this event was Tom's latest book called Digital Transformation, Survive and Thrive in an, area, in an Era of Mass Extinction. Courtesy of Tom, there is a signed first edition of this book for everyone here tonight. So thank you so much, Tom. And that will be available for you to pick up after the onstage program. As always, there are lots of people and groups to thank. Um, certainly, in addition to Tom, we thank Rich Karlgaard and Lauren Kuhn for their assistance with this program. We also thank Microsoft Reactor, especially Josh Lubke and Alexa Easley for hosting us. We appreciate that very much. And finally, to 3M and Henry Chang, very special thanks for your support as well and welcome. Um, if this is your first time attending a Churchill Club program, I'm pleased to offer a brief introduction. Founded in 1985 and kicking off with our first speaker, Bob Noyce, then CEO of Intel. A controversial talk at the time, I understand. Um, today we are the premier independent thought leadership uh, forum or platform here in the Bay Area. Um, our nonprofit mission is to strengthen innovation, economic gro growth, and societal benefit. And we do this through up to, say, 24 programs that we present every year. We look for what is new, what is next, what is not widely known, because that helps us to lean into the topics instead of repeating things that perhaps um, are better known already. We try to pick up where those conversations take off. So before we bring up their, our speakers, there is one more thing to say, and that is that the hashtag is Churchill Club. You'll find other Twitter codes in your programs. So let's now welcome our guest of honor, Tom Siebel and Rich Kallgaard. Welcome. <laughs> before we get into C3.ai and what it means and the motivations and the big problems that it's solving. But Tom grew up in suburban Chicago, um, went to the University of Illinois, but then you took some time off. I know you, you dabbled in the publishing industry, um, you knocked around Montana, um, and then suddenly in your uh, late 20s, you were motivated to go back and get a computer science degree. Uh, which I think is a really cool late bloomer thing to do, that you took the time you needed to do it. What, what, was, what motivated you to do that? And then describe how that led you to Oracle in its early days, in the beginning of your terrific career. Well, <coughs> my undergraduate degree was in history. I studied the history of science. And uh, my first job out of undergraduate school was, uh, <coughs> I was a cowboy in Idaho, and so I was, moved cattle and cut hay, baled hay, and uh, then worked at uh, S&V Construction in Haley, Idaho. I was a uh, supervisor of a shovel, and used to carry that big Johns Manville um, asbestos pipe, uh, for which they've now gone bankrupt, so I used to load that and unload it from trucks. 
and uh, then ended up in the book publishing business with a friend of yours by the name of Jameson Campaign. I believe we published your first book in maybe 1978 or nine. Uh, I met Tom at the Boston Marathon. At the last word I'm yeah. running. In 1979, so we manned the booth. Rich and I go way back. Yeah. Do you and remember who our neighbors were? And uh, in, in that booth? Yeah, no, the, na the booth next door. No, I don't. All American Jog Bra Company. There, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, so then we, it was clear that we were going, you know, it was the, the country was getting ready to go into a recession, and I thought I would go to graduate school to learn the languages of commerce so I could play the game. And so I went, I was a resident of Illinois, and so I could afford to go to the University of Illinois. So I went to the Graduate School of Business at the University of Illinois to learn languages of finance and marketing and, and uh, accounting and what have you, so I could play that game a little bit more effectively. In the course of doing that, I took an operations research class and began to work in their computer lab and um, began to be uh, kind of pretty excited about this technology. Now we're dealing with mainframe computers and we're programming on, you know, key punch cards, holler cards, right? And so this is definitely the old days. And uh, then I read a book uh, that had a large, big impact about my life, upon my life that I talk about in this book, uh, written by a guy named Daniel Bell uh, from Harvard, where it was this book was entitled The Coming Post-Industrial Society, and he described this information era that we've been living for the last four decades. And so I decided to uh, learn the language of that game and uh, got admitted to the Graduate School of Engineering at the University of Illinois, did my graduate work in relational database, relational database theory back when there was virtually no relational database market and then I went to work for a young entrepreneur in Menlo Park by the name of Larry Allison. So that was the, uh, that's how it all got started. And um, how many people were at Oracle when you joined? 20 people. 20 people. Was it, did he uh, take kindly to you because you're, he was from Illinois also? Well, back then, we, you know, everybody had an interview with Larry and the other person ran the firm, Bob Miner. And uh, they were a very talented group of people. And, you know, if you wanted to, play in the relational database game in, the, in that era. The companies in the space were IBM, they had a product called System R, a company called Sperry in Minneapolis uh, that had a product called Mapper, and uh, then it was Oracle. That was pretty much it. Then there was a, there was a start another company in, in uh, Berkeley that didn't last very long. And, uh, but you know, these guys at Oracle seemed like pretty bright guys and looked like they might you know, pull it off. And so I decided to throw my hat in with them and it turned out to be a pretty good idea. Well, you got to participate and lead a tremendous period of growth at Oracle, um, something that would echo years later when you started Siebel Systems. I was just looking up uh, the sales growth of Siebel Systems in the, um, in the 1990s. Did you launch in 95, was it, or 96? Yeah. Uh, no, we did 93. Pat okay. House and I started the company in, uh, in July of 1993. And uh, the idea was, um, I actually took this idea to Larry uh, about applying information technology and communication technology to the problem of sales, marketing, customer service, which was now known as the CRM market, and we coined that term. Uh, and Larry had no interest in that business, and so I left, and uh, Pat and I had worked together, had been colleagues at Oracle, and I forget what she was doing at the time, and I gave her a call, and she dropped whatever she was doing and came over to the house, and we put together the business plan for C this company called Siebel Systems, and um, that was July of 1993. By 2000, we had 8,000 employees in 29 countries. We were doing $2 billion in revenue. We had a $53, million, $53 billion market valuation. That's when $53 billion was still a lot of money, so I know it's hard for you guys to relate to. And, that, that would be equivalent to VMware today. <laughs> that, 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 is the, uh, that uh, is the largest, fastest growing enterprise application software company, fastest growing software company in history. And so that was uh, quite an experience. Fastest to a billion, fastest to two billion, and I can assure you it was a well, professional experience of a lifetime. Yeah, I looked up, um, looked this up today that in uh, Fortune magazine, that other magazine that begins with F-O-R, 
um, had, uh, in 1998, you were the fastest growing company in America, 99, number three, and 2000, back up to number two. Yeah, it was quite an experience. What did, uh, just touching once again on Oracle, since you were there for that fast growth, what did you learn about that experience that you brought to Siebel, and what did you, what did you learn from Larry Ellison, because he, he did have an amazing ability to attract talent, and, and maybe more than um, a lot of other companies, a lot of Oracle alums have gone out and, and uh, taken the entrepreneurial path to great success. A lot of Siebel alums have taken the, the path to entrepreneurial success. You've got really one here, the Dan Streetman's here. He's the, 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 the CEO of uh, TIPCO. And it's uh, Vinnie Smith at Quest. Uh, um, there, Dr. Manum, who is Dave DeWalt, David Schmeyer at Velocity, Dave DeWalt. Uh, at uh, Documentum, and then he went on to what, FireEye? So there's, I mean, uh, but, uh, so working with Larry. So I spent a decade working with Larry, and Larry is a gifted guy, make no mistake, and he's built, you know, one of the great information technology companies. But I have to say that, and it was a great learning experience. Um, uh, I will tell you that, but when we formed, when Pat and I formed Siebel, I would say the litmus test that we used for almost every decision was, you know, what would Larry do? And we did the opposite, okay? <laughs> and so I, I think I learned more uh, how not to run a software company than how to run a software company. With that being said, it was a professional experience of a lifetime and a, and a great learning experience. And Larry Ellison is a extraordinarily talented guy. Well, eventually you sold Siebel Systems to, um, to Oracle, and then you were in a position where my goodness, uh, the writer Tom Wolf. Um, I always think of Tom Wolf because Karen mentioned Bob Noyce as the first Churchill Club speaker in November 1985. And um, the great writer Tom Wolf, who wrote the right stuff on the astronauts and, and um, electric, had written all kinds Kool of stuff. So electric Kool Aid acid tests. Uh, electric Kool Aid acid tests following Ken Kesey and those guys around mm -hmm. in, in, 19, in the 1960s. He claimed he never participated in the in the chemical part of that journey. But um, in fact, he wore a coat and a tie as he was following um, the, the merry pranksters around, if you can believe it. But he wrote, uh, he, he wrote that uh, uh, piece, and God, I got so tangled up in my thoughts now. Uh, where was I going with that? Good Lord. Um, oh, well. He would have called you a man in full. He had a novel called A Man in Full. So you, you, sell, you sell Siebel Systems to Oracle. You're a man in full. You're a multi-billionaire. You're beginning life as, a, as an uh, acknowledged major philanthropist. Um, you're an outdoorsman. You've uh, got a huge ranch uh, that is both fun but also a business ranch in Montana. Uh, you're a man in full. Um, why do another company? Great question. Um, if I might tell an anecdote, so after we started Siebel, Larry, the way that Larry will, um, became kind of very emotional about it and, uh, and decided that very publicly, you know, that he was going to put us out of business. And so he staffed 3,000 people for a decade to take us out of the CRM market, and 10 years later, he had less than 1% market share. That being said, this battle was fought on the front page of Business Week and Forbes and Fortune and the Wall Street Journal, and he was quite vocal and quite emotional. And it was, um, you know, and you know, the media kind of loves to write about these cat fights. And so there was a lot of media attention. It was very rancorous. And I'll never forget, I think it was, let's see, it was about the fall of 2005 when my assistant says, it's Larry, Larry Ellison on the phone. I thought, oh my God. And, uh, the, and so I said, I picked up the phone and I said, well, Larry, I assume you're not looking for a sponsor for your America's Cup boat. <laughs> uh, without, without skipping a beat, he says, that's not a bad idea, but we need to put the names in alphabetical order. <laughs> and uh, then uh, one thing led to another, and Siebel Systems is now part of Oracle Corporation very successfully. You know, but why, you know, after four decades do I find myself as the CEO of yet another computer software company? You know, that's a great idea. That's, you know, that's a good question. And I ask myself that every morning. No, seriously. 
Um, I have a great job. I work with enormously talented people. I get to work with really gifted customers with, uh, with whom we have, I would say, intimate relationships. And one is here tonight, 3M, thank you very much. Um, you know, I do this because, you know, maybe I'm, there's not much I'm good at. You know, if I could play golf, maybe I would do that. And, uh, but, you know, I can't, can't do that. And, you know, if there's anything I'm good at, it is assembling a group of talented people. And uh, I have been fortunate in my professional career to be in the right place at the right time um, three times and then not completely botch the opportunity. And so I think now we find ourselves in the right place at the right time again, and we're going to try to not goof up the opportunity. Now, when I first came across uh, C3, I just naturally assumed C3 meant company number three by Tom Siebel, because there was an interim uh, between Oracle and Siebel Systems where Tom was the CEO of a software company called Gain, um, which he sold uh, actually, yeah, before to, to, Cyb to Cybase. Yeah. So I figured it was your third company. But in fact, you started, did, didn't you start C3? It stands for something else. And didn't you have this kind of nonprofit idea of using IT to take uh, carbon out of the atmosphere? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> good memory. So we, you'll recall that in the, um, if we get into the 2006, 2007, 2008 timeframe, there's lots of discussion about global warming, cap and trade, carbon tax. Um, if we had an energy policy at the time, it had to do with, you know, kind of occupying the Middle East. And um, that was kind of it. And um, so we wanted to, we got together with a team of people uh, many of whom are here tonight. Uh, Pat was there and Dan was there and uh, the energy team from McKinsey and Company, a lot of the founders of Siebel Systems like David Schmeier, who you know, uh, Ed Abbo, um, uh, people from Intel, Oracle, SAP, from all over around the world. And we got together to talk about how we could have an impact on the de energy dialogue at global scale. So the original idea was about taking what we saw as a new step function in information technology, these being uh, the, you know, at the, the emergence and confluence of elastic cloud computing, big data, IoT, and AI, and applying those to the energy dialogue to see if we could have a, a, an impact on the energy dialogue at global scale. And so it was about building a technology foundation. It started out of uh, a philanthropic effort. And by the end of 2000, we met in the, in the spring, uh, spring, summer, and fall of 2008. And Pat House, the way that Pat House will do, kind of took charge of the situation and, um, and put everybody off in work groups and, the, and, and, and you know, kept writing on, on the schedule with their action items. And by the end of the year, it became apparent that we'd have a larger impact as a uh, for-profit corporation than a non-for-profit uh, philanthropy. And so then the idea came to found uh, this company and there were about 50 people in the room and I said, well, who wants to be CEO? Because I'm not gonna do it. And then we, um, I sent out an email on Friday night. We raised $20 million by Sunday and the company was funded. And so yes, it did start, very much start as a clean energy company and we then, so we worked with organizations like Cisco, and I think there's some people from Cisco here tonight, and we, we reduced Cisco's energy and carbon footprint by 15% at 700 facilities around the world, uh, Dow Chemical, uh, General Electric, long story, um, um, and others. And we went from doing it at the enterprise to d then doing it at grid scale with you know, PG&E and Con Ed, New York Power Authority and Duke and, and Nell in Europe and Engie. And so then after we had done this at grid scale quite successfully, well, we can use these technologies. The grid is the largest and most complex machine ever built. And, and, and we can, uh, and it is being sensors it's becoming this thing called the smart grid, right? So that all the assets in the grid infrastructure are being uh, sensors so they're remotely machine addressable, generation, transmission, distribution, meters, thermostats, what have you. And so these sensors generate massive amounts of data and we can take all these signals and apply AI to increase the efficiency of the grid by maybe 
30%, increase the resilience, in, uh, increase the you know, cybersecurity, increase the reliability, reduce the power that it takes, the fuel that it takes to power the grid by maybe 10%, and cut out the greenhouse gas footprint by a factor of two. So that was what then C3 Energy was all about. And then as the market evolved, it became apparent that, um, you know, that people, and this was basically about applying big data, IoT, and AI to solve problems that had been previously unsolvable. As we get into 2014, 15, 16, it becomes apparent that everybody wants to do this, not just utility operators. And so in 2016, we relaunched the company that said uh, that we could now, C3.ai, could bring these solutions to all markets. So today we serve leading manufacturing companies like 3M, uh, United States Air Force, Defense Intelligence Agency, um, uh, Caterpillar, uh, we're the AI platform at Royal Dutch Shell, we're the AI platform at Baker Hughes. So we've become uh, the world's leading provider of industrial and commercial AI solutions. And why do you think it came together that way? It's an interesting sort of, uh, it's not a conundrum, I'm probably looking for a different word. But uh, we had at our Forbes CIO conference about a year and a half ago, we had, um, Diane Green, who is still the CEO of Google Cloud. And she said something that I know um, Scott Guthrie at Microsoft, who runs Microsoft Azure, would say, uh, Andy Jassy at AWS would, would say too, that there's this feeling that the pace of digital evolution has sped up, Diane said, by a factor of two to three. The root level of digital evolution was running two to three times faster than the kind of 50 year period that we were just coming out of where Moore's law was the governing factor of how fast the digital evolution could occur. And this is occurring funnily enough at a time when the semiconductor people were telling you that, that, the, that Moore's law was actually slowing down because you're getting to such microscopic densities and the cost of a new fab is five to $10 billion that Moore's Law went from maybe 18 months uh, doubling to two, 24 months to now, maybe you know every 36 months. So A, do you agree that the root level of technology is speeding up? And B, how, how is that happening when actually the rate of semiconductor progress is on the margin slowing down? When I went to work for Oracle in 1983, the worldwide market for information technology was, say, $50 billion. Today, it's $3.5 trillion, and in five years, it'll be 8 to $9 trillion. So it is definitely accelerating. As it relates to this phenomenon that we call digital transformation, which is associated with these technology vectors that we discussed, uh, McKinsey Global Institute describes this change that's happening as, you know, 10 times faster than the Industrial Revolution with 300 times, okay, more change happening. So this is, you know, 3,000 times the impact of the Industrial Revolution. So this is big. Now, while Moore's Law may in fact be slowing down, this relates to the number of, uh, of uh, transistors that we might, you know, the density of, of, uh, of transistors on a semiconductor. In fact, with the cloud, it's effectively accelerating. So now we have, I mean, it used to be not that long ago, when we used to compute on you know eight bit processors at at um, you know three hundred hertz, hertz cycles, right? So we need to be we need to be very careful about how we're using those space and those registers and those clock cycles. So today, with the Elastic Cloud, we can compute on literally tens of thousands of processors in parallel, doing sixty four bit floating point operations, and storage is virtually infinite, and all of this is essentially free. So I think by the time Andy and Satya are through sl slitting each other's throat, this stuff will be free. <laughs> so we have you know, infinite computing capacity, and infinite computing capacity available to you tonight, and all you have to do is put your credit card on the line at you know, Microsoft or Google or AWS. I mean, infinite's a big number, and uh, it's a lot of capacity, and so we're able to solve problems that were previously unsolvable, and um, it is a major change, and it is, it is definitely an accelerator. Well, in your book, Digital Transformation, you um, not only cited Daniel Bell and the history of technology and 
and how that affected society. But she also quoted the late great paleontologist Stephen Jay Gould and his theory of um, punctuated equilibrium. Punctuated equilibrium means that the, because the fossil record um, supporting evolution has these gaps in it, um, you know, you, you have, you, either we're missing the parts of the fossil record, huge major parts, or there are these periods in time when, when um, the pace of progress doesn't go up in a linear way, it jumps the tracks. You know, the meteor strike happens, the dinosaurs go in, extinct, something else happens to take its place. And you talked about this using Gold's analogy, talked about that we are an era of uh, where business around the world is experiencing now or shortly experience a punctuated equilibrium. Tell us, uh, tell us what you mean by that. Okay, so Charles Darwin, uh, you have many of you read or certainly everybody knows about on the origin of species and he came up with this idea of natural selection as the driver for the speciation of the planet. And everybody thought, and Darwin thought that this was a continuous function much like Moore's law. And the problem was he couldn't explain the gaps in the fossil record. And he read, I think this is roughly, this is the middle of the 19th century, I think 1859, okay, when he published The Origin of Species. That could be off by a couple of years. No, that's, that's, that's correct. That's about, that's a good guess. Okay, and the, okay, now, but he couldn't explain the gaps in the, in, in the, in the fossil record. And what he said is, well, we just haven't found those fossils yet. And it wasn't until 1972 that Stephen Gould, an evolutionary biologist from Harvard, said, well, it, evolution was not a continuous function. And in fact, it's you know, highly discontinuous. So I think the planet's been around for about four and a half billion years. We've had life on the planet for roughly three and a half billion years, okay? And in the last, say, 400 million years alone, we've had you know, five mass extinction events okay, on Earth where and one, in, in these mass extinction events, as, as many as, as much as, you know, 96% of the species on Earth would be, become extinct. And the most recent being this KT extinction that we all know about where the, uh, this meteor hit in the Yucatan, what, 65 million years ago? And the, this is when all the, you know, volcanoes erupted and we had mass climate change. And the, vol the uh, dinosaurs had been enormously successful species. They had been on Earth for order of 100, uh, 150 million years, and uh, they became extinct. And so when these events happened, and you had these big um, uh, voids in the ecosystem, we'd have these mass re-speciation events. And so where all these vacuums would be filled by new species, and they've got these organisms with new DNA. Well, that worked out well for us because the mammals filled the space that the dinosaurs had, and so that, that story so far is going pretty well. And uh, it, you know, what, the reason that I draw this parallel is as I got involved in C3 and, you know, I'm going around the world visiting with CEOs in Singapore, New York, Chicago, Minneapolis, um, San Francisco, Rome. Um, we have all, all of a sudden the CEOs at the table, okay, talking about the mandate for digital transformation. I've been in this business for four decades. Okay, the CEO was never at the table before, right? It was, I mean, as we brought mainframe computing to market, mini computer, personal computers, relational database technology, enterprise application software, CRM, the cloud, it was always the CIO, right? And the CIO was there making the, that was the, the gate, that was making technology decisions. And the CIO would, as we brought these two new technologies to market, the CIO would invariably decide they, they were gonna build it with his own, his or her own team was gonna build it themselves. And then, you know, you wait for that person to get fired and come back two years later and you'd sell them the product. This is how, this is how it works. And now all of a sudden at the table, we have the CEO is at the table. I mean, where'd the CEO come from? Like I'm mandating this thing called digital transformation. And this is what inspired the book. Because I'm, I'm talking to these people at the companies like, you know, whether it was uh, State Grid in, in China or Engie in Paris or Renault or, uh, or uh, BlackRock in New York. And you know, when you poked at the question, it was clear that nobody had a common view of what it was. You never really got a, you know, they were all kind of blind people touching the elephant trying to figure out what it was. And so after eight years of 
of talking to people, I sat down to write the book, and I, I think I know what it is. I think, in fact, we are experiencing a mass extinction event in the corporate world right in this part of the 21st century. And in fact, in the last 18 years, 52% of the Fortune 500 companies have become extinct. They're gone. They're off the list. I mean, where is Kodak? Where is Westinghouse? Where is Toys R Us? Where is Sears? Okay, where is GE? GE might still be on the list. I don't know. Uh, but not for long. Anyway. Uh, um, uh, uh, and then we, you know, see in the newspaper every day and in, in, in Forbes and Fortune and the Wall Street Journal and, and on in Google, we're talking, we see about all these companies that are all here with new DNA, right? And so we have, you know, let's take Tesla. Let's look at what te what's Tesla all about. I mean, I'm not sure whether Tesla's going to be successful in the long run or not, but they most certainly are going to upend the automotive industry, right? And so this is all about, you know, big data, AI, IoT, and on wheels. Okay, ditto for Uber. No cars, no drivers, and they're changing the transportation business. How about retailing? Yeah, Amazon. I mean, 8,000 retail outlets in the United States alone have closed in the last 12 months, and yet you'll have Amazon, AI, IoT, big data, focused at retailing. And they're doing a pretty good job, right? So now, so I think what this is about is this is recognition from companies that, I mean, imagine, okay, when we brought, say, ERP systems to market, accounting systems, nobody needed that. I mean, they were going to build it themselves. Imagine today trying to run a company without an accounting system, without an ERP system. It's unthinkable. How many companies today operate without CRM systems? Oh, that would be none, okay? And yet when we brought it to market, nobody needed it, and they were all going to build it themselves. And now uh, there's, a, you know, there's a recognition, I think, on the part of leading CEOs at companies like 3M, uh, a, a, with, with great vision and companies like the, organizations like the United States Air Force, the Department of Defense, the Department of the Army, um, and now NG, Royal Dutch Shell, Baker Hughes, that you know, unless they embrace these technologies and become leaders in their field, that they will become extinct. They'll be acquired by, you know, they'll, they'll cease to exist. That's what I think this digital transformation is about. I think it's an it's a existential mandate, and we kind of have two classes of CEOs. We have those who are leading their companies uh, with great vision to be um, uh, to really thrive in this 21st century economy, and there are those who are, you know, basically waiting, sitting around, hoping to make it to retirement, and you know, those are the companies that, you know, will how, cease to exist. How do you see this accelerated rate of evolution to the point where it's a, you know, a, a situation of punctuated equilibrium? It's sort of playing out differently across different industries, though, that in the either highly capital intensive industries or highly regulated industries, which are often the same industries, they've got more time to think this through, or do they not? And yet, I mean, the perfect example of capital intensive, highly regulated would be the utility industry. Okay, and, and that might be the, the you know, the, um, you know, the, the pinnacle there. And that was the, the first industry, I would say, to adopt AI and IoT at massive scale. And so I think this is, you know, when we're done, this changes everything about computing. I think this is, a, you know, this market is expected to be for just at this space of basically industrial and commercial AI is a quarter of a trillion dollar software market in 2023. Well, 2023 is a blink of, a blink of an eye, folks. A quarter of a trillion dollars is a pretty big software market. Okay, uh, the, um, and so I think that this is adopted in manufacturing, it's defense, it's intelligence, it's government services, it's manufacturing, it's automotive, travel, transportation, communications, consumer packaged goods. There's no industry that has not changed. Um, what do intelligent people misunderstand about AI? I mean, you, you make a pretty clear distinction between a general AI, which is a lot farther out there, and then highly specific, very effective AI. But I think, um, at least in, if not in business, at least in popular culture, the two get conflated. But uh, tell me how you look at that. I mean, what is AI able to do? What will it be able to do in 
five or ten years, what are what are the thornier problems that may take another generation or two? Uh, great question. And um, you know, the analogy that I use is, you know, Julius Caesar used to say that you know Gaul was divided into three parts, and I think you can look at AI that way too. The first you have AGI or kind of artificial general intelligence. This is kind of the Google DeepMind idea, where we're in the idea of the singularity with Ray Kurzweil, where we're gonna you know, develop computers that are you know, as smart or smarter than human beings. And this is the idea that of the computer, this is the you know, malevolent robot that you have in the refrigerator that takes over your house, okay? I don't think we need to worry about that anytime soon. And so I, I think that you know, all the hype aside, this doesn't happen anywhere near in our lifetimes. I think if we look at the, at the you know, compared to a human being, I think if you look at the most powerful computer that we can conceive of today, it has the intellect of basically a mealworm. Now, okay, the, 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 let's go to the third category, which is the use of AI for social media. Now this, I think, what's going on there is, um, you know, truly malevolent, okay? And I think we have, this is really problematic where the social media companies have figured out how to manipulate people at the level of the limbic brain. So the limbic brain, this has to do with the release of a neurotransmitter called dopamine. And this is, you know, while it happens every day when you hug your spouse or you shake somebody's hand or you have a cup of coffee, you get a release of dopamine. It's also what happens if, you know, you do a couple of lines of methamphetamine, okay? Except that it's just there. It's like a couple of orders of magnitude larger and it causes some irreparable damage. Now. There's a professor at Stanford by the name of B.J. Fogg who has written a book on you know, how to use computers and manip manipulate people at the level of the limbic brain. And there are social media companies that are using that to manipulate, say, 2.2 billion people at a time. And this is causing, this, there are some adverse consequences associated with this in terms of you know, we have a tired generation of people who, you know, who are being affected by these technologies. I can remember, I sat next to, what's his name, uh, Michael Zeisler uh, at, a, at a Goldman Sachs dinner. And he, this guy would say the most outrageous statements. And one of them he said that I haven't stopped thinking about. He said, you know, Tom, when history is written, social media may go down as the most destructive event in the history of civilization. And I think he might be right, okay? And so we're either, you know, this, you know, the consequences of this, or the benefits are substantial, okay, but the consequences, you know, loneliness, depression, suicide, okay, with the weaponization of these systems, okay, the, the, you know, we're questioned, and it's a fact, I think it's questionable whether we're able to, you know, you know, whether democratic processes are able to function, you know, as it, the weaponization of these systems, so this is, this is really troubling, okay. Now get off that rant. Okay, I'm getting ready to hold a, a conference on this subject at the University of Chicago next month. Who's the Siebel Scholar that's in the room? There's some Siebel Scholars here, right? Uh, and uh, Brian and some others. Well, that, if you come to Chicago, okay, it's going to be good. Uh, the, um, the, and the, the topic is social media. What could possibly go wrong? And it'll be at the <laughs> University of Chicago, and it's going to be interesting. Now, let's get to the third category, is the use of... Uh, artificial intelligence to, for business and commercial processes. This has to do with precision medicine. Uh, this has to do with production optimization. This has to do with a problem we call stochastic optimization, the supply chain, supply network risk, customer churn. And this is mostly all you know, sunshine and light, okay? But it has, you know, it enables organizations to deliver products you know, and services at lower costs, more effectively into the hands of more satisfied customers. It enables, for example, precision medicine, where soon we'll be able to predict for the population, say, of the United States or France, but the United States, say, we have roughly, what, 30, 330 million people, and we'll be able to tell in advance who's going to be diagnosed with what disease in the next five years. And, well, that's, you know, then we can intervene clinically and avoid the diagnosis. So the social and economic consequences of that are pretty good, right? Well, the, well, the genome sequences of the population of the United States in this database, and so we'll have, in this data set, so we'll have genome-specific medicine, which will be enormously efficacious. Adverse drug reaction, AI-assisted medicine. I don't think, contrary to the IBM ads, I don't think computers are going to replace physicians anytime soon, but they certainly will assist in more accurate diagnoses. Now, 
what's the downside? I mean, so healthcare, people live longer, they're healthier, healthcare is lower, we have lower rates of addiction, addiction being an adverse drug reaction. Okay, we, um, um, what's the downside? Well, who, who is running this system? Okay, is it the healthcare provider? Is it the United States government? How are they gonna behave? We know the companies don't behave well, okay? In, in many, you see Silicon Valley for details. And, okay, and um, it's to see social media for details. I know I'm getting myself in trouble here. Uh, but, you know, now, what are these companies gonna do with these data, okay? Who cares about pre-existing conditions when we know what you're gonna be diagnosed with in the next five years? Are we gonna use this to set prices? Are we gonna use this to withhold care? Are we gonna use this to prioritize who gets care? Well, you know it's going to happen, okay? And, by, oh, and oh, by the way, I mean, how are they gonna use these data about, you know, which of us is gonna be diagnosed with terminus, terminal illness in the next three years? And do you wanna know? I mean, I'm not sure I do. So it's pretty scary stuff. And I think, you know, there are some, you know, there are some, uh, you know, personal privacy issues associated with what's going on here that are daunting. And, the, you know, also as this IoT phenomenon you know, continues to promulgate, which is kind of IoT and AI are two sides of the same coin, I mean, this dramatically increases the service area that's available for cyber attack, right? And we have bad actors, um, you know, who are peppering our uh, critical infrastructure and financial systems and grids, power grid systems with viruses, okay, and malware, where they can just turn these systems off. And so, you know, weaponization of these systems, the privacy issues, the security issues, I think there's some very troubling problems that I don't think society is yet ready to address. And if we don't address them, we will not be happy. And all you wanted to do is help remove carbon from the atmosphere when, you, <laughs> when you thought of this. But that leads me, and you've, you've got uh, in your customer base so far, you have, um, you're really strong in uh, electric utilities, oil and gas. Um, what are, what are what, what's next for C3A? I, oh, uh, the Defense Department. Um, fighter jet uh, maintenance, um, predictive maintenance. Where, um, where, what, what customer sets out there do you think are next for uh, C3 and what problems describe those customer sets? Well, manufacturing will be a huge market for us. And I think you know, one of the, the leading company in that field today in terms of using, using AI to optimize manufacturing processes is in fact 3M out of Minneapolis. Uh, oil and gas will be huge. I'll go with Royal Dutch Shell, it's about a 300 billion euro company um, that is you know, transitioning themselves to a clean energy company, to a very clean energy company, using AI and IoT to you know, decrease the environmental impact, okay, uh, increase the, the rate of renewables, okay, increase safety, increase liability, lower cost. Um, Defense and intelligence is huge, what we do in AI-based predictive maintenance for the United States Air Force, E3 Sentry, C5 Galaxy, F-15, F-16, F-18, F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, uh, Space Command, okay, we're, we're now tracking um, you know, all these objects that are out there. Um, Precision Health for 3M, again, uh, a leader in this field. Um, it's Every problem we're solving is a problem that has never been solved before. At, for example, the grid operator, largest grid operator in the free world is a company called Enel. Uh, they're based in Rome. They have 60 million meters in 40 countries. Putting that in perspective, there are 100 million meters in the United States. So this is a pre, uh, serviced by 3,250 utilities. So this is a pretty big utility. And uh, in Spain and Italy, we have aggregated 10 trillion rows of data from 42 million meters, 75 million sensors, all their enterprise information systems. And then, this, then from we go out to the extranet for terrain, social media, and weather. Uh, this is 10 trillion rows of data aggregated into a petabyte image. It grows at 300 gigabytes a day. We process these data at a million transactions per second uh, to dramatically increase the safety, resilience, reliability of that grid infrastructure. And then at C3 alone, we update that database 65 billion times a day. That's just on our end, okay, with weather, social media, terrain, 65 billion times a day. Get your mind around this. So these are um, 
you know, and there's no problem we're working on that's ever been solved before, but it's really difficult stuff, really challenging, and it's really fun. What would you say is your um, primary business model, your unfair advantage in a marketplace that so many different companies see? Uh, I mean, give credit for, to GE for seeing it. You know, they didn't score a lot of points on the execution front. But what is, wh how do you see the unique niche and set of capabilities that C3 occupies? Great question. Uh, we spent a decade and about $600 million building a technology platform uh, that's something called a, a model-driven architecture, which is, I would describe as a next generation uh, software architecture, kind of beyond, the next step beyond what most of us know, which is structured programming. And this model-driven architecture is what we call a complete, a complete suite that allows our customers, be it in defense, be it in financial services, the Bank of America, be it in manufacturing, be it in the grid, be it in the, in the oil and gas business, to rapidly design, develop, provision, and operate these kind of very massive industrial scale AI and IoT applications. Now, a piece of software that works is a, uh, is a, it, it took us uh, 10 years with some highly, very highly experienced people to accomplish this. I think that for another company to do it, I think it would take them a minimum of 10 years to do it. The difference being, if a large company tries to do it, they're gonna do it with one or two or 3,000 people, and with one or two or 3,000 software engineers, you can't do anything. Mm. And uh, I mean, that, that so, we have a piece of software that works, it works very well, and that is the competitive advantage. And we have some people who I think are, are quite competent. Uh, for those of you who have come to visit us, um, we have, I think, about 400 you know, extraordinarily bright people. Last year we had 40,000 applications for 100 positions at the company, 40,000 applications. We had 10,000 in the last three months. So this would be uh, in there, People are coming from, you know, from Rome and Boston and Paris. Um, I think we'll likely be three to 4,000 people in three years. And uh, to work there every day just is palpably um, kind of vibrating with excitement and enthusiasm and energy. And we're visited by customers. Today we were, today we were visited by the under Secretary of the Army and his staff, the executive team from 3M, two CEOs and the executive team from Coke Industries and the CEO of NG North America, that's one day. And uh, so it's, the place is just on fire. It is really fun. Uh, with all that meant and the IPO window is wide open, uh, say what you will about that, but are you tempted to jump through it? Uh, I have been, I was the CEO of a public company for 43 quarters, so. Who's, but who's counting? And uh, so I'm pretty familiar with that experience. I think that you know the most likely outcome I think is that C3 will be a standalone public company. But you know when you look at many of the companies that are going public today, they have no business being public. And you know when the music stops, the things are going to come crashing around down around them, and it's going to be horrible. So you know I am. Yeah, unfortunately not 21 years old, and I didn't graduate from college yesterday. I'm not looking for my 15 minutes here, and we're not gonna take a company public before it's ready to be a public company, but if and when it's ready, I think that's, that is the most likely outcome. Well, um, we are now open for audience Q&A. How are we gonna handle that, Karen? Okay, we've got mic runners here, so. Questions. Yeah. Right got, here. Got hands if you please identify yourself, that'd be great. Yep, my name is Lindsay Gore. I'm with Microsoft, so thanks so much for coming. Um, I just had a question as a younger person in this field, and I love your sort of story about finding yourself and going back to school. What's your recommendation about that if you were coming up in this generation today, especially given all the major technological change you've seen and predict in the future? If I were uh, graduated from school today, okay, okay, I would go to work for Okay, with a great leader like Microsoft. Okay, okay, and and okay, and I would learn how it's done. I would learn. I would learn how to support customers. I would learn how to market product. I would learn how to sell stuff. I would learn how to hire.
people. I would make a bunch of mistakes. Somebody else sense. Okay, and then I would go out and start my company. Uh, but you know, Microsoft would be a, a great example of uh, a really, really uh, superlative organization to work for, and I mean that very sincerely. You, you, you know, why Satya is on, not on the cover of every magazine in America is something I can't quite see. Should be. Next question. Yes, we're very involved with uh, one of our customers called Energy, about a 70 billion euro integrated energy company based in Paris. Uh, the CEO is our partner, is a physicist, a woman by the name of Isabel Kosher, and we're involved in smart cities initiatives. For example, we've taken over the entire operation of the energy footprint for Ohio State University. Okay, and we're going to go cut the ribbon on that, I think. Uh, the 25th of next month. Okay, we're dramatically, um, I mean, we're doing, now we're doing, getting ready to do the same thing for the University of Illinois system, some major hospital programs, and that will be a global initiative. But Smart Cities is clearly one of the big opportunities, whether it relates to energy, whether it relates to maintenance, whether it relates to, you know, variable tra uh, speed limits to reduce traffic congestion. So I think there's a huge opportunity there, and yes, we are all over it. Next question. I'll be getting off easy here, uh, Rich. Hi, uh, John Paul Farsight from uh, 75F.io. And uh, my question was uh, related to the origin story of uh, C3 and uh, how it came from initially talking about global warming and, and solving all that. And uh, one big part of that equation is uh, building, uh, basically office building and other similar building technologies. And what do you think about the potential for digital transformation to disrupt the building controls and building uh, equipment market? I think it's a huge opportunity and we're all over it. That was the first product we built. Okay, this is the same technology that we're using at Ohio State University, University of Illinois, Cisco. Uh, we're using it at NG in Paris. And so I think that, you know, we will dramatically change the way that you know people think about their energy and carbon footprint in managing their facilities around the world and I think there's a, there's a huge opportunity there and we're very active in that space next sure. question hi good evening uh, Charles Casty from McKinsey and thank you so much for being so generous with your time this evening um, one question I just wanted to ask you was about um, construction which is an industry I didn't hear you mention at all and if I think about so many of the enablers for the that, and things that just have to happen to deliver a step change in terms of carbon usage or indeed deliver on some of the wider promises of some of the other technologies we've talked about. This is the only industry in the world that's seen negative productivity growth in 50 years. And as I've been working with my colleagues, we've sort of really struggled to get much traction with digital use cases in construction. I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that topic. You know, it's a, it's a great question. It's not, you know, you, you've, you've hit firmly on an area that I know absolutely nothing about. <laughs> and. Uh, I, I will say, uh, I spoke at a Bechtel conference about six months ago, and they've had a big generational passing of the torch a couple years ago. So the, uh, the CEO of Bechtel today is, is in his late 30s, and um, I think gets this. Uh, how deeply he gets it, I don't know, but, but, um, uh, but I saw a clear generational change in that big construction company's attitude. Raj, how are you? Doing good, Tom. Good seeing you for uh, the security of all these wonderful new attacks. Raj is a civil scholar from what year? Kind civil of scholar, class of 2001 from 2001. Chicago. 2001, where, Chicago? Chicago, yeah. Chicago University I'll see you in October, looking forward to it. Nice to see uh, you. For all of these uh, new attack surfaces that are being created, who do you see as making the greatest advances for securing it, public sector, private sector? Neither seem to be doing well for really protecting some of the cybersecurity aspects of all these great new technologies. Well, I, it's a great question. It's a really important question. I think that what's going on in AI is absolute warfare, okay, and it's kind of open warfare now with China. 
Um, the you know, Vladimir Putin said in 2017, whoever wins the war on AI dominates the world. I think that's true, and it will not be Russia. Uh, so <laughs> the, um, you know, I think the Chinese are spending $20 billion a year right now on AI and going to $60 billion soon. Uh, and it is, a, you know, we have a, um, um, this is a war that we do not want to lose. I think fundamentally, you know, this is a test of two uh, diametrically opposed political philosophies. Or in the case of China, we have a top-down command and control uh, totalitarian state run by the NRDC and they call the shots, they write it up in the 13th five-year plan, and everybody kind of does that in lockstep. Now, in the United States, we have this very messy free market economy where things happen in garages in Palo Alto and storefronts in the box. And, uh, you, know, in, you know, historically, that system has worked well, and I think this will be the ultimate test. And if we lose this one, we will be very unhappy. Hi. Can you hold the mic a little closer? Yeah. Uh, you're on. I think, honestly, AI may contribute to these social and political problems more than it might solve them in the short run, I mean, really, and contribute significantly. And so I think, you know, this is a, you know, this is a very significant technological change. That, and these changes, the consequences are not all good. I mean, let's look at the invention of the Gutenberg press, right? The, you know, movable type, the printing press. The result of that was now you could, you no longer had scribes writing Bibles only in Latin. Bibles were written in whatever the name of it, native language was, and the result was the, you know, the Reformation, Martin Luther, and centuries of religious war. Okay, we can draw a straight line between the, between the invention of, you know, the steam engine and the card loom, uh, you know, well, the benefit was the Industrial Revolution, right? And a lot of people would argue that was a pretty good thing. I think probably it was, okay? But at the same time, you got a straight line between those developments and, you know, child labor, communism, World War I, World War II. These were adverse consequences that didn't work out so well, okay? The, 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 the current exchanges going on between China and the United States are just, you know, continuation of World War II. We still live in that shadow. And so you can draw, so why I think there are enormous social and economic benefits from AI. I mean, I think the social implications of what's going on in, so, in social media are really deleterious. The political implications are deleterious. I think that we're, these technologies that, that I'm involved in bringing to market, uh, we need to be very careful about this stuff. We need to think about what the consequences are and if we don't anticipate the consequences, and you know, I mean, you don't know me very well, but I have like no use for government, right? And the, you know, but this is a case where I think that if government does not step up and do its job and regulate, we will be very sorry. Yeah. Hi, uh, Dave Rowe from Doremus. Uh, you had some nice things to say about Larry Ellison earlier. Just wondering about your feelings on Mark Benioff and Salesforce. And looking back to the rivalry between Siebel and Salesforce with the benefit of 2020 hindsight, if you might have done anything differently to kind of blunt the disruption that Salesforce caused. Um, I know Mark very well. He's a very talented guy. He used to work with him at Oracle. I candidly, I don't remember any rivalry between Salesforce and Siebel. When we, about the time we sold Siebel to Oracle, Salesforce was about that big. Okay, and uh, so Salesforce was still a footnote. It was later on that they developed into a real company, and they've been obviously enormously successful, and Mark has run a hugely successful company, and, and, and good for him, it's not that easy. So, um, you know, I know him, I'm proud of him, and I, um, I think he should be very proud of what he's accomplished. We have um, come to the end of our time, so let's give Tom a big hand. Ladies and gentlemen.
our speakers disband, we would like to thank you with a small token of our appreciation. And it is, of course, the Churchill Club speaker t-shirt. All right, thank you. Thank you. That's got it. Thank you, thank you. And Please wear that in very good health. Um, wanted to tell you about a few upcoming programs quickly before we disband for the evening. First, this Thursday up in San Francisco, we're putting AI algorithms in the org chart, asking whether AI algorithms perhaps ought to be trained and coached the same way people are, uh, given the way that they are deployed and given how, I suppose, black sure boxy they are. The um, then on the 12th of right September, now. we have our Churchill's event, the ninth annual, and there we're going to have uh, senior executives from Slack, Peloton, Zoom, also Carl Guardino from the Silicon Valley Leadership Group, and John W. Thompson, the chairman of Microsoft. And then on the 16th, we have Brad Smith, the president of Microsoft. We're working on new programs beyond that, so please do keep an eye on us and join us when you can. You have been a wonderful audience. Thank you so much. Good night. Yeah, yeah. He wants to zap us a couple times. <laughs>